Hello, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I pray that wherever you may be, you may feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life in that we all may feel his presence in our hearts today and when we finish these meetings here we may finish with the assurance that we met jesus christ today we are going to continue the seminar the church of god at the threshold of eternity in the topic for today is our duty towards civil authorities we are living in a world that's in commotion a world full of problems there are people protesting in different places, in different parts of the world. People claiming for their rights, people claiming for the rights of women, people claiming for their rights of freedom. And for us as Christians, until what point we are supposed to obey civil authorities? If the first question is, are we supposed to obey civil authorities, the authorities of this world? The word of God is very clear. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 4, says the Bible. Let's read together. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 4. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that there are are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist, is, resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou, will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he bears not the sword in vain, in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. That's what the word of God tells us, that the authorities that exist, they have been ordained by God. They are ministers of God to take care of society, to take care of you and of me. So we are supposed as Christians to obey them, to be subject to higher powers and understand that God has these authorities in his hands. Many people, they think that the presidents, the kings of this world, the governors of this world, they are there by chance. But we have to remember that everything in this world is in the hands of God. And the Bible here tells us clearly that the authorities that exist, they are placed by God. The Bible makes it very clear that a king is in power until God allows him to be. If God wants to remove him, God will remove him. That's not the work of the church, to take side of politicians, to get involved in politics. It's in the hands of God. God controls the nations. We don't know which king, which president he's going to place, but we are supposed to obey and to serve those that God puts in authority. Therefore, that's what the Bible is telling you and me, to be subject to higher authorities. The Word of God still tells us, 1 Testimony, page 361, The ten precepts of Jehovah are the foundation of all righteous and good laws. Those who love God's commandments will conform to every good law of the land. We are supposed to be good citizens. We are supposed to honor God, glorify His name in such a way that people may see our good works, serving the authorities of our country, serving our countries, and glorify God for what God has done in our lives. We as reformers, we are supposed to be the best citizens of this world. Christians, we always respect the authorities of this world when they are legislating the good laws that are based in the commandments of God. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says the word of God. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Do you understand what the Bible is telling you and me to do here? The Word of God is telling us not to speak evil of any man. Many people that profess to be Christians will be tempted 
to talk against the authorities, to talk against the president of their country, to talk against the, against the governors. But the word of God says, speak evil of no man. By the contrary, be meek toward all men and talk good about all men. So that's our duty as reformers, to pray for the authorities of our country, to talk good about them and never get involved in politics and criticize the leaders of our nations. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 13 and 14 makes it very clear what is our duty. It says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as a supreme, or to, unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So that's our obligation. As Christians, we are supposed to honor the king. We are supposed to honor the governors. We are supposed to honor those that are in the leadership of our land, of the land that we live in. We are supposed to be good and the best citizens that can exist in this earth. Are we going to pay taxes? Are we supposed to pay, pay uh, uh, taxes to the government of this land? That was a question asked to, uh, to Jesus one day. And I would like to read with you this story here today in Matthew chapter 22, verse 17 to 21. And let's extract from here a lesson for us and let's understand what God is telling us here. It goes beyond. This story gives us more than just saying that we are supposed to pay taxes to the presidents, to the governors, to the leadership of the countries we live in. It goes beyond that. And I would like us to meditate upon it at this moment. Let's read together. Matthew chapter 22, verse 17 to 21 says the word of God. Tell us therefore, what thinkst thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypo hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image in superscription? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So Christ made it very clear here that we as Christians, we are supposed to pay taxes. He said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. He asked the people to show him an image, of, uh, show him a, a, a money, and they brought him a penny, and he said, which uh, image you see in this penny here? And they said, the image of Caesar. He said, give it to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Now, dear brethren, there, there is something that no one asked Jesus here. When he said, and give to God what belongs to God. Maybe you today want to ask Jesus, what belongs to God? We should understand what belongs to God. And we can extract it from this passage here. Because I can imagine... If we would ask this question to Jesus, what is it that belongs to God? He would just turn again to us with a question and say, what image you see in yourself? We were created in the image of God. Therefore, we belong to God and we are what God expects to receive from ourselves. The whole being, we as a whole, we belong to the God, to the creator of the universe. His image is imprinted in you, therefore you belong to him. The inspiration in the first Timothy chapter two, verse one to three, tells us that we are supposed to uh, pray, to raise supplication, intercession for those that are in the leadership of our nations. I would like to read with you this verse here. Uh, first Timothy chapter two, verse one, two and three says the word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodliness 
in honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. The inspiration tells us here that it's acceptable before God. And that's our obligation as reformers, as Christians, to pray for the authorities in our countries, to pray for the presidents, for the governors, for the leaders in our cities, that we may live a peaceful, peaceful life with liberty, with freedom, religious freedom. And uh, it's our obligation to intercede for these people before God. So the work of, the, of Christians in this world, the work of reformers, is not to get involved with politics. It's not to take side of one po politician or another. It's our place to pray for those that God has placed in authority. If God chooses a man, who are us to remove the man? We don't know which man God is going to choose, but he... The Lord, the King of Kings, He is leading this world. He is leading the affairs of the earth, this planet we are living in. And He knows better than us. That's why He said, live with me. I'll take care of these matters. I have a different work for you to do here as my children in this world. God has a specific work for His church. And the work of the church is not to, to get involved in the affairs, politi politics, of this world, says the word of God in Acts of Apostle, page 38, uh, 68, I mean. We are to recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment and teach obedience to it as a sacred duty within its legitimate sphere. But when its claims conflict with the claims of God, we must obey God rather than men. God's word must be recognized as above all human legislation. It thus says, says the Lord, is not to be set aside, for it thus say the church. Or it thus says the state. The crown of Christ is to be lifted above the diadems of earthly potentates. So that's the orientation of God here. We obey, we recognize the governments of this world. But above all governments, says the word of God, is the law of God, is the word of God. The crown of Jesus Christ is more powerful and has more authority than any crown of the potentates in this world. That's what the word of God is telling you and me. But that, on the other hand, says the inspiration, we are not supposed to provoke authorities. We are not supposed to, call, to search for a reason to uh, disobey them. Let's read together. Acts, Acts of Apostle, page 69, says the word of God. We are not required to defy authorities. Our words, whether spoken or written, should be carefully considered, lest we place ourselves on record as uttering that which would make us appear antagonistic to the law and order. We are not to say or do anything that would unnecessarily close up our way. We are to go forward in Christ's name, advocating the truths committed to us. So that's our obligation. Advocate the truth that is uh, given us by God, committed to us to spread in this world. We are not supposed to take uh, place in uh, protests. We are not supposed to uh, cause persecution, unnecessary persecution to the church by uttering words that can give the impression that we are rebels, that we are against the laws of this world, that we are against the authorities of this world. By the contrary, we are supposed to follow what the Bible says, pray for them, be gentle, be kind towards authorities, respect them, and serve our countries as much as we can as good citizens, obeying the word of God in the lands of, uh, in the laws of this world. The inspiration on First Testimony, page 361, tells us, I saw that it is our duty, in every case, to obey the laws of our land, unless they conflict with the higher law which God spoke with an audible voice from Sinai, and afterward engraved on stone with his own finger. He who has God's law written in the heart will obey God rather than men, and will sooner disobey all men then deviate in the least from the commandment of God. The wisdom and authority of the divine law are supreme. So at this moment here, the word of God is very clear, telling us that we are supposed to obey God in first place. 
God has supreme authority and we have to put him before any other authority. It's our work to magnify and exalt the law of God, to magnify and exalt the character of God. Sixth Testimony, Testimony Volume 6, page 395 says, It's our work to magnify and exalt the law of God. The truth of God's holy word is to be made manifest. We are to hold up the scriptures as the rule of life, in all modesty, in the spirit of grace, in the love of God, we are to point men to the fact that the Lord of God is the that the Lord God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. So that's our obligation to obey God in first place. But this text here we just read said we should say it kindly. We should say it uh, with love and explain to the authorities that we are supposed to obey God first, then the laws of the country in second place. We are not uh, supposed to do it with rebellion, with a spirit of rebellion, but with grace, showing Christianity, showing the spirit of Jesus Christ, explain our duty to God in first place. In Acts chapter 5, the, the apostles faced a situation, starting from chapter 4 of Acts, they started facing a situation where the authorities tried to forbid them of preaching the word of God. And let's read what happened, what they did. Uh, the, the Testimony, volume 6, page 395, comments upon it and explains to us what was happening. And the Bible tells us what was the position of the apostles in those days. Uh, Testimony, volume 6, page 395. Let's read together. In the name of the Lord, we are to go forward, unfurling his banner, advocating his word. When the authorities command us not to do this work, we, when they forbid us to proclaim the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus, then it will be necessary for us to say, as did the apostles, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And on Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter said the words that we will have to say someday soon. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. That's our position, brethren. As church, as reformers, as Christians, we obey the authorities, but God comes in first place. I want to share with you an experience. The experience of the stoat. The stoat is a, a, a small animal. Uh, it's also known as a short-tailed weasel. Uh, some other people know it as the ermine. This small animal, uh, it's common in the Eurasian region, region. It's also found in some place in North America. So this animal, it's, it's, he's very careful with his fur. And he's very clean. He's all the time cleaning his fur. And uh, this uh, weasel, this kind of weasel, species, species of weasel, uh, it's known because his fur is expensive. So uh, hunters go to hunt the, the stoat to kill it and sell its fur. And it's known that when the hunters go to find the stoat, first they try to find uh, where he lives. And uh, when they find the place where the stoat lives, they stay there waiting for it to come out. Once this uh, small animal comes out, then they send the dogs after the stoat. And of course, he's running for his life. And when he's running, the hunters come and they put some dirty in the entrance of the house of the stoat. Of the place where the stoat is living. And uh, once the stoat find a way to come back and try to hide in, in, in his place, he finds that there is dirty in the entrance. And not to get himself uh, dirty, he then he stands and he faces the dogs. And most of the time, he's going to lose his life. But he doesn't want to get uh, dirty in himself. Dear brethren, the example of this small animal is a great example for us as reformers, as Christians. 
a time is coming when we are going to have to face two options. Shall we obey God or, or obey man? When this time comes, we have to do as the apostles did. Follow the example they left for you and for me and serve God above all things, even we, if we have to sacrifice our lives. But until then, we are not supposed to get involved in the affairs of this world. The Bible tells us that we should let the dead bury the dead. What it means is that some protests, some confusions, some things, some affairs of this world that people are fighting for, we are not supposed to get involved in them. Some of them might even seem to be good things they are protesting against. They might be defending something that may appear to be good, but Christ was very clear, said, let the dead bury the dead. There are other people to take care of the affairs of this world. World, We are not supposed to get involved in politics. Now the question that has arrived to us as well. What is our position regarding vaccine? The brethren are asking, are we going to take vaccine or not? We already have resolutions on this regard. Our position, according to the General Conference Session resolutions, is that we discourage the use of any drug, especially vaccination of children, and that we support and encourage the use of simple and natural remedies in our sanitariums and clinics and homes. The spirit process is very clear that we should avoid the most we can drugs. Another resolution of the General Conference says that as medical opinion is divided on the question of vaccination, we cannot force any member's conscience on this matter and that our members should be educated in this question with available material based on second select message page 280 and 281, which affirms that drugs are rarely necessary. I hope it's clear. We avoid drugs the most we can. That's the orientation God gives us. There are some situations when using a drug might be better for our health. Some situations where if we don't use it, we might even die. So the, word, the spirit of prophets, the word of God tells us we should be wise in this matter. Are we going to take it or not? As reformers, with the light God has given us regarding health reform, I believe most of us will do our best to avoid drugs in general. However, vaccines don't need to be our greatest concern. And I want to appeal to all, church of our, to all members of our church around the world not to fight among ourselves for this matter, not to accuse one another for taking their own uh, position on this regard, their own decision whether they will take vaccine or not. At this moment, we should avoid, until things are more clear to us, avoid even to express publicly our opinions. You may have your own opinion and you are entitled to it. But we should not be campaigning against vaccine at this moment. We are not experts in these things. What we are supposed to be preaching is telling people that we need to follow health reform. We need to have a proper diet. That having a proper diet will help us to avoid many diseases in this world. And we should advise people to follow what the Word of God tells us about health reform. We should ourselves improve our health reform. And we should pray for one another. That when the times of tri trials come upon this world, we may stand before God. Vaccine should not be our preaching for today. Our message for today is the three angels' messages. We should preach to the world that there is a judgment going up, up in heaven. We should preach to the world and tell people that Christ is coming very soon. We should let people know that the law of God needs to be kept. God has a day for us to keep. And it's the Sabbath day. This is our message. A time will come, says the word of God, when we are going to be forbidden to preach these messages. And that's the time when we have to stand and obey God before obeying man. If we are forced to take any kind of medication that we understand is going to be harmful for our bodies, we should remember the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 where he says, And fear not them which kill the body, 
but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, and trust that God will take care of all of us. We have to obey God. And that's the point that we have, be to be, we have to have in our conscience. And brethren, above all, once again, I want to remind you, my appeal, let's not fight for the things, for the affairs of this world. Not let's fight among ourselves for the small things that may bring a division among us, but let's pray together that God gives us wisdom and strength to take the right decision and stand on his side when the time of trials come to each one of us. For closing, I want to read Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. It says the word of God, What shall we then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And I want to remind you, you are the image of God. You have been created at the, uh, as the image of God. You have this image in you. You belong to him and he will take care of you. Calvary is your assurance. Calvary is my assurance. Let us all look to Calvary and see the great love God has demonstrated for us. And in the time of trials, we will stand on the side of Jesus Christ, who died for us and who will save us from the problems of this world and take us to a world better than this one. So may God help us to honor the King, honor the President, the governors of our countries, and above all, honor the Lord our God. Amen. Mm -hmm.